Dear all, welcome back to this third day of our school. Thank you very much for your attendance to this school. Today, we have the pleasure to be uh, with uh, Dr. Gustavo Cruz Diaz. Gustavo is uh, currently working at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the USA. He uh, does laboratory astrochemistry simulating the physical conditions of the interstellar medium. They generate ultra high vacuum in a hermetical sealed chamber. Wow. <laughs> they grow ice analogs by depositing gas in a substrate. Then they irradiate the ice mantles with UV photons to break the molecules, including chemistry and uh, producing complex organic molecules in the process. They use a cryostat to reach cryogenic temperatures and they perform quadruple mass spectrometry, infrared spectroscopy, and millimeter and submillimeter spectroscopy. Gustavo, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. How are you doing? Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. Okay, so I will leave you with the presentation and uh, thank you very much again for your participation. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gustavo Cruz. Uh, let me introduce myself again. Um, thank you, everybody, for connecting to this uh, virtual school. Um, I hope you're having a great time. Uh, I will have a great time uh, giving this talk. Uh, talking about my research is, is always um, a pleasure to me. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, let's get to it. So I'm going to talk about laboratory astrochemistry. Um, you will know uh, by the end of the talk what I'm talking about. I hope so. And um, I'm currently in the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, in the US. And I work in the Whitaker Weaver group. So I'm going to talk about laboratory astrochemistry, but uh, I'm going to be focused on in this interstellar ice analogs and how you can recreate space conditions here on Earth using state-of-the-art uh, technology. But first, let's start with a with an introduction so you understand um, what I'm talking about, and um, so you have like a broad vision of what is my my field, my research field. So uh, this is the life cycle of the interstellar medium, and um, let's start with the first part. Let's focus on the uh, diffuse interstellar medium. This region in a space, you'll take into account that space is vacuum mostly, but it has regions where you can find molecules. Uh, this is one of those regions, is the diffuse interstellar medium. It's called diffuse because it has a low density of molecules, is about 100 particles per cubic centimeter, and it has temperatures of about 100 to 200 Kelvin. Uh, you can find in this region mostly hydrogen in the molecular anatomic form. Um, uh, uh, some percent of uh, dust particles and heavier uh, elements, depending on the region that you are looking. Um, but uh, this region is uh, as all, uh, every single uh, region in space is uh, constantly subjected to different ener energetic uh, processes. One of them is the um, uh, in interstellar radiation field and is mostly far ultraviolet radiation. So it's high energy photons. So in these regions, we also find a smaller portion that we call dense clouds. The dense clouds are, as the name suggested, denser than the diffuse medium. Uh, it has a density of about uh, 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter and temperatures of about 10 Kelvin. So we are talking about really, really cold regions in space. Um, these regions are, are where you can find 
uh, not only hydrogen, but you can also find traces of heavier elements, like molecules, for example. Uh, those molecules are volatile. So are like um, uh, small molecules, uh, like water, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. But these regions are also subjected to different kind of uh, energetic processes. Um, for example, the interstellar radiation field um, penetrates the interstellar, uh, the um, diffuse um, regions, and uh, it reaches the dense, the dense clouds. But because the dense, dense clouds are denser, so it, it reaches only the surface or the out part of the dense clouds. It creates a boundary called a PDR, a photo dissociation region. Um, but this doesn't mean that the, the material, the molecules inside these dense clouds um, are not suggest, subjected to uh, energetic processes. We have uh, what we call cosmic rays. The cosmic rays penetrate deeper into the dense cloud. And these uh, cosmic rays are heavy, um, heavy atoms or cores with high energy, and they will interact with the hydrogen inside the PDR. Well, sorry, the dense cloud, and um, exciting that hydrogen. And when the hydrogen relaxes, it emits a UV photon. So you are basically um, having cosmic ray bombardment. Uh, in the dense clouds, and also a secondary radiation, ultraviolet radiation field that would process all the molecules inside. So um, here in these dense clouds, uh, we also have what we call um, the dust particles. Interstellar dust particles are um, the reservoir for uh, volatile molecules. So one of the characteristics of these dense clouds is that they are volatile depleted, which means that all those molecules that are in the gas phase, they are condensed in the, on the surface of the dust particles, creating what we call an ice mantle. And I will talk about the ice mantles later on. But for now, have in mind that these regions are cold, they have dust, and the, mole the volatile molecules, they like to stick on the surface of the, the dust particles. So if we um, move on on the life cycle, we can find uh, smaller cores where um, uh, stars can be formed. So by accretion, you have the, the star forming. And because of these process of accretion, you have that the dust particles, they migrate from the outside part of the envelope to the inner part um, uh, of, the, of the core to feed that uh, star that is, uh, the protostar that is um, forming. And it's here where those ice mantles that were created in the dense clouds can sublimate and can enrich the, the, the 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 medium so if we continue with the cycle we have here a uh, protoplanetary disk protoplanetary disks are extremely important uh, for life because they are uh, the link between astrochemistry and periodic uh, chemistry so um, that's because all the material that you have, you know, the diffuse uh, clouds, dense clouds, then protostar, all that material gets incorporated into the, the protoplanetary disk. And that disk is the one that fits the, um, the planet formation. So that's why it's so important. And it's in these three kind of scenarios where we can find ice mantles. So if we go on with the with the process, we create our um, solar system, and at some point the star is gonna die, 
um, it will explode or yeah, depending on the mass of the star, and you will have all that material get um, incorporated again into the interstellar medium, completing the cycle. So let me recap. I told you that uh, this dense clouds uh, and actually dense regions in the in the space is where we can find um, the ice mantles. So let's start with dense cloud. Uh, they are cold and they have a lot of uh, molecules inside, and they have also the interstellar dust particles. So it's actually in the surface of these interstellar dust particles where we can find atoms um, sticking to the surface. But atoms are really light, so they move around all the time. They move around all uh, uh, over the, the surface. And uh, because they move around, uh, there is a high chance for them to just encounter each other. For example, creating uh, molecules. In this case, this is a radical, is the OH. Uh, I didn't mention, but uh, red is oxygen and um, white is hydrogen. So um, because hydrogen is so light, um, it can reach that OH radical and stick to it creating what we call a uh, water molecule. But um, this happens all the time. Um, the, the lifespan of, of the, the molecular clouds are in the million years. So they have a lot of time uh, for this process to occur. So it happens again and again and again. And we, if we forward, move forward, we can see how uh, these molecules, these uh, molecules that are trapped in the surface of the dust particles are taking over the surface of the dust particle and create at the end what we call an ice mantle. This ice mantle is not necessarily um, made of just water, um, as I'm going to show you later. So uh, how do we know that this is true? Like, how do we know that what we have in space is uh, actually ice, like uh, solid um, phase molecules? They are not in gas phase, they are in solid phase. How how we know that? Well, uh, observations. Um, here you have four different uh, sources in space. Um, and this is observations in the infrared. And as you can see, uh, here, all of them have similar um, similar features. Uh, let me show you this. This is an inference spectrum of uh, water ice mantle. And as you can see here, these are the main bands of water. This is the stretching, bending, and libration. And this is uh, the main feature of water. And you can see it here, 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 here. So water is really important uh, in space and life, mostly because one of the most abundant molecules in space is water. So as I told you, you can see water, the water feature here. Um, you can see you can see water mostly everywhere you you look at. But not only water, you can see other volatiles like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and heavier molecules, or you can say uh, more complex molecules like ammonia, methane, and uh, methanol. But the composition of this um, ice mantle is not well mixed. So you have that um, in the inner part of the ice mantle, the part that is uh, closer to the surface of the um, of the dust particle, uh, you will have uh, more hydrogenated uh, molecules like water, methane, and ammonia. And in the other part, um, you will have the, 
the ice is dominated by, by uh, carbon ice molecules for like carbon, molecule, um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methanol. And as you can see here, uh, this is um, more or less the abundance of the different molecules in the space and in the ice mantle, I mean, uh, where water is, yeah, is uh, the most abundant one and you have CO, CO2, methanol, and ammonia and methane in the lower ratios. So <clears throat> we have the, these dense uh, regions it can be the dense clouds, it can be the protoplanetary disk, uh, the, the, um, uh, what we need is that it's dense and cold. And it's here where you find uh, dust particles uh, creating these ice mantles. The ice mantles can be water, methane, CO, CO2, depending on the region, um, uh, the ratio, I mean, and, but, um, these ice mantles, they are not static, so they change over time, all the time, mostly because they are in a really harsh environment in space, and they are constantly subjected to different kinds of processes. So UV radiation, um, cosmic ray impact, um, heating, shocks, like anything that you can think about, they are subjected to it, uh, which means that they, they experience different kinds of um, processes, like, for example, desorption, recombination, diffusion. All of these creates, um, uh, generates a chemistry in the eye. So this is solid chemistry. At the end, uh, what you have is, because you are, uh, I didn't mention this, but what you are doing with those energetic processes is breaking all the molecules into pieces, into atoms, into radicals. And those atoms and radicals, they move around, they recombine, and they create uh, heavier molecules uh, with time. So at the end, we have a rich chemistry of an ice mantle. And uh, this ice mantle um, is really important for life. Why? Because what we're trying to answer is how far can we go in space, um, in ice chemistry, how far can we go um, with the radiation of ices? Can we produce really complex molecules, like for example, amino acids or um, proteins in space? If that's the case, then life should be everywhere. Should be really uh, not easy, but um, you can find it uh, mostly everywhere in space. If this is not the case, if you cannot create those complex molecules in space, uh, it means that um, the building blocks of life, they need uh, a special environment like Earth. Like you need a uh, surface, you need uh, an atmosphere, you need a temperature. So uh, that means um, life will be a little bit harder to find uh, because uh, you will have to look for really special places in space. So um, I told you that these ice mantles are often subjected to different kinds of radiation. One of them is the interstellar radiation field. And as you can see here, is mostly photons in the high energy. And uh, one of the characteristics is the Lyman alpha peak. Lyman alpha is really important to process uh, the ice mantles. And also the cosmic rays. The cosmic rays, depending, depending on uh, the region that you are in space, you, you will have more energetic ener uh, cosmic rays or less energetic cosmic rays. So what is the uh, scenario for those organic complex, uh, the complex organic molecules to, to create? So, Let's recap a little bit. We have, for example, here a protoplanetary disk. Uh, sorry, a uh, uh, dense cloud uh, that is uh, that you have a uh, uh, protostar uh, in the center. Then you have in this stage um, a dust particle 
that is accreting accreting all these uh, molecules, create, creating an ice mantle. So, for example, let's take the methanol molecule. And uh, if uh, at this stage there is a uh, Lyman alpha photon that reaches the surface of the ice mantle, it will break the, the methanol molecule into different radicals. So CH3 plus OH or CH2OH plus H or different other uh, fragments. So I told you they are not static, so they they store, uh, they go inwards um, the the center, and <clears throat> uh, you you will start to have more mobility of those um, um, radicals because the temperature is going up. So they recombine uh, uh, into uh, more complex uh, molecules, but they continue with um, with uh, the evolution and they reach temperatures where um, ice mantles uh, do not exist. So they sublimate because at those temperatures, um, molecules cannot be in the solid phase. So they sublimate. So, and they enrich all uh, the, the, proto, the protoplanetary disk that, that they are in. So that's how the that rich mole, molecule that rich chemistry gets released into um, the the disk. So how do we know that we have this gas phase um, complex organics? So the, the the complex organics molecules that I just told you that they sublimate because the temperature is too high. It's not too high, it's 100 Kelvin. This is still really cold, but for the ice mantles, that's too high. Uh, how do we know that, that that's true, that, that, that we are having that those rich uh, molecules um, incorporated into the gas phase? Well, again, observations. Uh, you have these two uh, sources in space. One of them is high mass uh, source. The other one is a low mass source but um they are not that different when you zoom in uh you can see where um you can see all that chemistry that happens in uh high mass um high mass regions happens too in the low low mass regions so uh this is basically telling us that everywhere in space you can find these uh complex molecules in in gas phase So now we get to the laboratory part. Um, how we know, how we, how can we uh, recreate those hard conditions uh, of vacuum, uh, low temperature, um, ice mantles, uh, dust particles? How can we recreate that in, in the laboratory? Well, we do it with state of the art technology and uh, more precisely, we do it with ultra high vacuum setups. This is the one uh, that I, I, do, I did my my PhD uh, with is on uh, is in in Madrid in Spain. Uh, this uh, this is one in NASA Ames that also is ultra high vacuum setup. We have there is another one in Leiden University. And of course, we have one here in the University of Wisconsin Madison. So what they all have in common is that to do um, research with this kind of setup, you need a way to evacuate all the gas uh, or basically all the air that is inside these chambers. You need a way to evacuate that. And with that, we use uh, what we call a Turbo molecular pump. You can see this is a small turbo molecular pump that is backing the big turbo molecular pump that is, you cannot see it here, but yeah, is underneath the, the chamber. And a turbo molecular pump, uh, think about the turbine of a plane, uh, not that big, but a little bit smaller. But think about uh, the turbine of a plane. And it's constantly sucking all the air. 
that is inside this chamber. So they are really powerful and they allow us to go to uh, pressures of 10 to the minus 10 torr. This may not tell you anything, but believe me, that's really low pressure. So this is what we call ultra high vacuum, um, ultra high vacuum. So uh, at those uh, pressures, the, the densities are around um, 100,000 particles per square uh, per cubic centimeter, but we can improve that with different kind of um, of different kind of pumps. For example, a getter pump that will allow you to remove all the water that is inside. Water is the most abundant uh, molecule, not only uh, in space but on but also inside the chamber, mostly because water likes to stick to the walls. Um, also, we have uh, a lot of hydrogen. I will show you later. We have a lot of hydrogen too, uh, which is um, uh, because hydrogen uh, is trapped in the walls of uh, the chamber. So you constantly are de constantly are degassing all the hydrogen. So um, with these kind of chambers, we can go as low as uh, 10 Kelvin, but we also can um, we can control the temperature. We can go easily from 10 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin and simulate uh, like, a, like a dust particle that is getting uh, warm up because of this evolution uh, in the protoplanetary disk. And um, we perform uh, infrared spectroscopy, of course, because uh, we want to check the solid phase of uh, the ice mantle that we are creating. And for that, infrared is the best tool for, uh, to do it because it's a non-invasive um, radiation. Infrared does nothing to the, to the ice mantle and you get a lot of information from it. Uh, we have quadruple mass spectrometry uh, that is basically counting uh, the amount of molecules that we have inside the, the chamber. I will show you um, like a spectrum of it. And that's how we know concentrations of uh, the different molecules that we have inside the chamber. Uh, we performed recently, uh, this is one of the, the uh, unique uh, chambers that can do millimeter and some millimeter um, spectroscopy here in the chamber. Like we can compare our data with uh, observations, for example, uh, taken with ALMA. This is a really innovative um, uh, new tool that we are applying. And um, yeah, um, I will tell you about it, uh, about it later on. Uh, to simulate that radiation that um, the ice mantles are experiencing, uh, we use what we call a BUV lamp, a vacuum ultraviolet lamp. I will show you these lamps later. Um, but basically, they are a source of Lyman alpha uh, photons. You can also uh, do um, buy like uh, electron guns. Uh, electron guns are um, these uh, devices that can accelerate electrons. Uh, so you have like a really nice uh, cosmic rays uh, analog. Also, if you take your chamber and go to um, a synchrotron accelerator, you can have heavier molecules, uh, sorry, heavy, heavier atoms simulating uh, more realistic uh, um, bombardment of the ice mantles. Okay, I told you that we can go to 10K. And to do that, we use a cryostat. This is a cryostat. This is, this is the head of a cryostat. And it has a long arm that reaches until the center of the chamber. And it's actually the tip of the cryostat that gets really, really, really cold. So in the tip of the cryostat, we put a substrate. This substrate uh, can be uh, in two ways. It can be solid like this one, and uh, this is gold um, gold cover. So you can have like a really nice uh, reflection. And um, 
we use that kind of uh, substrate to do um, uh, infrared in reflection. So the, the beam goes here, uh, penetrates the eyes, uh, bounces on the, on the substrate and goes back into the detector. Or you can have a hollow uh, substrate like this one, where the beam just goes through the middle of the, of the substrate but in this in the center you put an infrared transparent window mostly they are mostly made of um, a salt salts are really transparent to infrared radiation so you can have uh, an absorption of the ice mantle but uh, it depends on what, what you want or what you need in your laboratory so as you can see here this is a schematic of the, the chamber uh, we have the turbo molecular pump here. We have the backing pump here. And um, to deposit our ice mantle, we use a gas line. Uh, this is the gas line where you have um, different kind of uh, inlets. And uh, you use this uh, to, to connect different kind of bottles of pure uh, molecules. For example, you have a bottle of oxygen, a bottle of carbon monoxide, a bottle of nitrogen, a bottle of carbon dioxide, and so on. So you can uh, put a little bit of those gases inside, mix them, and then deposit the, the mixture. Uh, for um, liquid uh, samples like water and methanol, we use a vial, a flask, actually, a flask that we contain the, the liquid and we use actually the vapor pressure to deposit the ice mantle. But this ice mantle, um, it can be controlled. Uh, for example, uh, speaking in a morphological way, uh, this ice mantle uh, will depend on the angle of the, the, the position, the rate of the deposition, the pressure of the deposition, the composition of the, of the gas. So, um, and also, it depends on the temperature of the deposition. For example, here at 10 Kelvin, you have a really porous uh, ice mantle. Um, but if you go uh, to higher temperatures, this is really amorphous and porous. And if you go to higher temperatures, you will end up with a less porous ice mantle and actually a crystalline uh, ice mantle. So for the energy source, as I told you, we use um, UV lamp. So these ultraviolet lamps, uh, they are these um, hollow um, quartz tubes where we can connect one end to a hydrogen bottle and the other end to a vacuum pump. So we create a flow, a flow of hydrogen and uh, we excite that hydrogen using microwave uh, radiation. So we excite the molecules of, of uh, hydrogen. When they relax, they emit this uh, Lyman alpha photon, as you can see here. This is uh, the UV um, spectrum of the lamps that we use in our setup. And as you can notice, it has a really sharp and intense peak in the Lyman alpha, which means that we are recreating the radiation that is constantly um, processing all the, the ice mantles uh, in, in, dense, in the dense clouds or protoplanetary disk. In the lab, we have a flux of photons of about 10 to the 14 photons per square centimeter per second. Uh, that compared to the diffuse uh, ISM and the dense clouds is like really, really, really high. But have in mind that uh, the ice mantles, they, they have time. Uh, in in the interstellar, interstellar medium, they have million years to be processed at these um, fluxes. Um, but we have done some calculations and if you irradiate uh, the UV, uh, if you radiate the ice mantles with this UV flux, in about an hour, you will get 
the same um, the same um, energy uh, deposited in the ice mantle if uh, you compare it to the ISM. So uh, this is um, the UV spectrum of the radiation that is actually processing the ice mantles in the ISM. And as you can see, the chart peak of the Lyman alpha here is well reproduced by our lamp. And if you superimpose uh, the lab, the, the UV, la, uh, the UV uh, spectrum of the lamp on the actual uh, radiation, you can see that we follow uh, the radiation really well. But not only that, this is the, the UV spectrum of the light that is reflected by Jupiter and Saturn. That's, this is the light from the sun. And as you can see here, there's a sharp peak in the Lyman alpha and some other peaks, same as our, our lamp. So uh, in order to monitor the solid phase of the uh, the solid phase molecules that we are creating in the ice mantle, um, we use um, infrared spectroscopy. The way to, to do it is uh, using um, FTIR. And uh, in this case, we have it in a reflection. So uh, it goes inside the chamber, penetrates, reflects, and then goes back to the detector. And this is the cryostat. This is the arm, coal arm of the cryostat. This is the substrate. So it's here in the top of this of this cryostat where we create our eyes and where we irradiate our eyes using uh, UV photons. So what is going on when you irradiate ice mantles? Um, infrared is really good because it shows you uh, the fingerprint of uh, the ice that you have. For example, this is a pure ice of uh, carbon monoxide. This is the main feature of carbon monoxide in the infrared. And uh, what we do is we deposit our ice mantle, we take a spectrum uh, as a base, uh, base spectrum, and then we start irradiating um, the ice mantle with different uh, intervals, different times. So, uh, and we watch what's going on in real time with that, um, with the ice, with the with the band. Have in mind that um, infrared, in infrared, the amount of molecules that absorb in the infrared are uh, directly um, proportional to the intensity of the bands. So what's going on when you irradiate the sample and you start seeing the decreasing the, the decreasing of the band uh, with time? It means that you are losing absorbers, you are losing molecules, mostly because they are going through the solid phase to the gas phase. I'm going to talk about it, uh, about it uh, in a minute. But these, uh, these changes uh, in the, the infrared band means that you are losing uh, your molecules and you are basically processing the ice mantle. And if you integrate this band and plot it with the fluence, uh, the amount of energy that you have put into the ice mantle, you, can, you get these really nice plots uh, that is telling you that uh, how much uh, energy you need to uh, remove molecules from the solid phase. So what is going on? Uh, what's going on is a process that we call photodesorption. So desorption is the process of uh, going from the solid to the gas phase. Photodesorption is, is that uh, you don't need temperature, you just need a photon and that photon is taking the molecules from the solid phase to the gas phase. So you have your uh, carbon monoxide ice mantle here represented with the, with these balls. And there is a, a UV photon that reaches 
the surface of the ice mantle, it gives this molecule enough energy to just uh, be released to the gas phase. That happens too if the, the um, photon gets absorbed in the inner part of the ice mantle, that energy is transmitted to the other molecules, the, the next molecule, until it reaches the surface and it, it ejects the, the molecule to the gas phase. So this happens um, all the time with uh, ice mantles. And uh, for example, here, uh, this is a pure ice of methanol. And what you are looking at here in the left is the whole spectrum of, uh, in the infrared of methanol. And you see, uh, this is the no irradiation spectrum. So we deposit the, the, uh, the methanol ice, and then we take the, the infrared spectrum. And this is the fingerprint of methanol. And when you irradiate it with time, you start seeing these features growing with time. But not only that, you will see that the band of the methanol goes down. So you are, in this case, you are destroying the methanol molecule into pieces and creating new molecules because molecules, they like to stick together and they like to react. And um, that's how you have, you, the, the, um, you have um, new molecules um, in your ices. So as you can see it here, you can see that the, the infrared um, feature of the methanol goes down with time. You can see here, uh, black is zero minutes, red is 240 minutes of irradiation. So it goes almost flat. And you can see how methane goes up, how carbon monoxide goes up, carbon dioxide goes up, and other kind of molecules. So um, I want to I want you to to um, to focus in this region because one of the problems of uh, infrared infrared is great. Uh, it helps a lot uh, with the identification of new molecules. But uh, the the difficult part with the infrared is that molecules uh, it, it detects the um, the groups, the functional groups of the molecules, which means that sometimes you cannot differentiate different uh, different kind of molecules because they all are in the same region and they overlap with each other. That's really difficult uh, to disentangle. And uh, we, I'm gonna tell you later how we can solve this problem. So what's going on with the pure methanol ice? We have the methanol ice here represented, represented, and we have the same UV photons reaching the surface of the of the ice mantle. We are breaking the the ice met, uh, the, the methanol molecules into pieces, and those pieces are recombining, and the energy that of that recombination is enough. For these kind of for the for the product molecules to uh, to go from the solid phase to the gas phase. So here is a spectrum of uh, the the gas phase. This is a, a spectrum made with a quadrupole mass mass spectrometer. And um, what I want to show you here is uh, these steps. These steps means that. We turn on the UV lamp and we turn off the UV lamp. And if you see the signal going up, it means that is reaching the gas phase. So basically, this is a proof of photo desorption. So we turn on the lamp, molecules are ejecting into the gas phase. We turn it off, nothing happens because it's the solid phase, it stays there. And the moment we turn on the UV lamp again, we have again molecules um, dissolving from the, the solid uh, ice mantle. So I told you uh, that 
the most abundant molecules that we have inside the chamber is, are hydrogen, water, um, carbon uh, dioxide, or nitrogen, depending uh, of what we have inside the chamber, and CO2. So here you have the same problem as uh, with the infrared. You cannot differentiate uh, molecules that have the same mass fraction. Okay, so for example, CO has a, an atomic mass of uh, 28, same as nitrogen, and the quadruple cannot differentiate those, those two molecules. That's the limitation of the quadruple mass spectrometer. This is why we do different kinds of um, techniques, because one technique is, is, is really good, infrared is, is extremely good with ice, but you cannot differentiate some of the molecules that you are producing. You use the quadrupole. The quadrupole is awesome. You can see all these molecules that are in the gas phase. But if they have the same uh, atomic mass, you are in trouble. That you cannot um, you cannot differentiate um, really easily what you have inside. Um, yep. Yeah. So. To do that, uh, to do these kind of um, detections in the gas phase, uh, we perform what we call uh, temperature program desorption, uh, TPD. So it's, it is basically the substrate is at 10K. We put a rate, a heating rate of one Kelvin per minute, for example. So the substrate will slowly uh, go up from 10 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. And what you have is this kind of beautiful uh, mass uh, spectra. You have intensity uh, here in the y axis, and you have temperature in the x axis. And uh, as I told you, you detect molecules depending on the weight. For example, light molecules like N2, like CO, they are really light. And they they sublimate at really low temperatures. So you heat up your substrate, you start seeing peaks all over um, the the temperatures that you are uh, applying, and that's how you detect different kinds of molecules. Uh, molecules with, let's say, middle range, um, middle range uh, of. Um, no, middle range molecules like CO2, uh, H2S, uh, they are about 80K uh, in sublimation. But when you have uh, heavier molecules, what you see is that they come out at a higher, uh, at higher temperatures, as you can see here. So I want to show you this. This is a pure methanol uh, experiment, and this is uh, the mass spectra of that experiment. So we deposit the methanol, irradiate the methanol, break the molecule, the methanol apart. They recombine into different other molecules. Then we heat up the substrate, and we start seeing all these speed coming out at different temperatures. So CO, it comes out really fast because it's light, but for example, water, it comes later because it's heavier. And um, yes, and so on. This is another example. This is um, pure methane, methane ice. And the same, we radiate the, the, the methane ice, and it breaks, uh, creates these all these molecules. And you can see how they go, um, how they sublimate with, um, different uh, different temperatures. So I told you that uh, infrared has a limitation for detecting molecules. Quadrupole mass spectrometry has a limitation for detecting molecules. That's why we use um, the millimeter and submillimeter um, radiation to uh, it identify the different molecules that we have inside. So the millimeter and submillimeter, uh, it proves the rotational spectra, uh, which is highly structural specific, which means that you have an accurate identification of the molecules that you have inside. So, and not only that, you can distinguish 
between different isomers, so different different molecules with the same um, with the same mass, you can uh, differentiate them with uh, the millimeter and submillimeter because it's a structural because the structure. So remember that I showed you this: the infrared cannot distinguish much of it. Well, you can use the um, a millimeter and submillimeter to identify the different molecules that you have in your eyes. As you can see here, CO, methanol, and H2CO here uh, have been identified. But not only that, we have identified different kind of uh, really complex molecules that uh, with the infrared, you cannot see it uh, with the, with the quadruple mass, you cannot differentiate but you can do with millimeter and submillimeter. For example, ketin, acetaldehyde, mini alcohol, ethanol, methyl formate, acetone, all those molecules we have uh, detect uh, in the gas phase. Okay, um, but you can ask like, what about the, the, the dust particle? We are using a substrate that is basically a metal uh, to study our ice mantles. So it is okay to study ice mantles if you are not, uh, if you're uh, studying the bulk of the interactions. So you're studying the bulk of the, of the ice mantle, you're fine. But if you want to study what happens between the surface of the, of the dust particle and the ice mantle, uh, for that, you need uh, something representative of what we have in space. And for that, um, for example, here, uh, this is a, a setup in NASA Ames uh, that uh, produces uh, different kinds of uh, dust particles. So for example, this is uh, here, they have uh, created dust particles using methane and you can see these small, really small uh, carbonaceous uh, particles created. <clears throat> and they have do, done the acetylene too. Uh, and they have created uh, these also really, really small um, interstellar dust particles, the analogs of the interstellar dust particles. But not only that, they have used uh, PAHs. Uh, like for example, benzene. And you can see also the formation of small uh, interstellar dust particles. And um, you can also create uh, dust particles using uh, methane, like a, like a plasma of methane. And you deposit it uh, on windows, infrared windows, and you can uh, study What's go what happens with these thin films of dust particles, uh, ana analogs. And we know that they are representative of space, mostly because the infrared um, spectrum. So you can see here two sources uh, where you can see these, uh, the red uh, trace matches perfectly with laboratory data. So um, I hope you by now know that uh, why the laboratory research is important. Um, mostly because we can see ice mantle in space. We can see dust particles. And we know for sure that they are extremely important in um, the, the chemistry of uh, the interstellar medium. Um, if you don't, if, if you have those ice mantles, you can form complex molecules, and those complex molecules can um, can be used as uh, building blocks of life. So, and you see all those complex molecules in space. For example, I told you meta methane and um, H2CO. Uh, you can see them uh, in the observations. And you can compare 
the data that we are having uh, with our setups, you can compare it directly to uh, observations. For example, here the um, Orion, uh, this is an Orion observation in red, and this is a methanol radiation in blue. And you can see how some of the bands, they match the peaks of, um, of the observations. But not only that, um, data that comes from, um, from our experiments, that data is also used in, in models. So laboratory is really important because you can identify the molecules that you are observing in space and you can use the data to create models that predict the different molecules that you can observe. But at the end, the big picture of astronomy is that you need models, you need observations, and you need laboratory because they are all interconnected. You, yeah, they are all interconnected. So the, um, if you wanna um, understand what's happening in space, you need the three of them. So some remarks, some remarks that I want to uh, leave you with is that in a space, uh, we have these core regions where dust particles exist. And in the surface of these dust particles, we can find uh, the, the interstellar ice, uh, mantles. They are extremely important for the chemistry of the interstellar medium. And they are extremely important in, uh, for the future of um, life. In the laboratory, we recreate these conditions using state-of-the-art technology. Uh, we use different kinds of um, techniques to uh, understand uh, the chemistry of the ice mantles and the chemistry uh, in gas phase two. So I want to thank you uh, for listening to my talk. Uh, I hope you have a good time. I certainly did have a, a good time talking about my, my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. This is incredible. Every time I hear these uh, talks during the week, I, I can see that there are so many things that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same, same as me. Every yeah. single time that you read a paper, uh, you, you find stuff that you didn't know and you just, yeah, the more you know, uh, the more you understand that you don't know anything. <laughs> exactly, something like that. Yeah, it, it's, it's extremely interesting. This is this is one of, if not the only, field in uh, astronomy and astrophysics where you can, you at least, can say, I can touch what is happening yeah. over there <laughs> somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. I will uh, tell you some of the questions that we have here in the chat. Yes. Awesome. So the first question is from Herman. Is there a way to compensate for the part of the UV spectrum where the lamp spectrum does not overlap with the dense cloud UV spectrum? Yeah, the, that thing is, is difficult, mostly because, um, because we have an ultra high vacuum chamber. Uh, you need windows uh, to separate the, the vacuum part to the atmospheric part, right? And those windows, uh, for example, the window that we use to uh, to introduce the UV, that window has a cutoff. The cutoff is around 110 uh, nanometers. Uh, we cannot go lower than that because the window doesn't allow us. And actually that's the best window that we can have right now. Um, the best way to avoid that will be to put uh, the actual lamp inside, and then you have the that portion of uh, that doesn't overlap. Okay, so next question is from Kevin. What were the main challenges you encountered in your research, and exactly in the experiment you mentioned? It uh, is referring to Sublime. Oh, I see. Um, the main challenges uh, is getting the setup running. <laughs> Excuse me, Gustavo. I, I will I will stop you a second. Can you uh, yes. uh, put your uh, your presentation out of a uh, uh, presentation mode, and can you move to the streamyard? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, at this moment, uh, Herman, can you can you show him again, please? Oh, Herman is frozen. Herman, can you show him again uh, the room, please? We want to see you. Uh, we want you to see that uh, you have many students over there watching you. Hey. They, are, uh, they are watching you live here at the university, and they are uh, willing to make a lot of questions. Will be my guess. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, I okay. would love to be there. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want you that's to see no, the right. students over there. So you were telling us about Sublime, sorry. Yes. Uh, the, the challenging part is to get the setup running. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art um, setup, but... Uh, they require high maintenance. They require um, so uh, a lot of different uh, processes that you have to follow. So getting the setup running is really difficult. But one is run once it's running, uh, you can take data like for months until something breaks, and then you start again uh, <laughs> trying for the setup to to run. Uh, that's the best. That's the most uh, challenging part. And um, with Sublime and with any other setup, basically. Okay. So Herman is back with another question. He says, "Can you uh, extrapolate your lab result to results to estimate formation time scales for volatile CH H2O CMOs in dense clouds as a function of the UV flux or CR ionization rate?" Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, you can, um, as I told you, you can um, you can uh, see the, the ice mantle using the, the infrared, and of course you have uh, the time. You can you take the time uh, and you have calibrated your UV lamp so you know how much photons you have and all that stuff. And the the amount of photons can tell you um, how many years uh, have passed, mostly because of the conversion between uh, the lab flux and the interstellar flux. So yes, you can do it. And you can, um, with the infrared, you have the, you have the abundance of those molecules. So you can see when they uh, start uh, growing you can see how they grow, and you can do that um, approximation. OK, thank you. And the next question is from Edgar. He says, a wonderful job, Gustavo. A minor question. In the case of pure ice samples, how do you deal with the eventual presence of contaminants? Yeah, good questions, yes. Uh, as I told you, the main contamination we have is hydrogen. Uh, you cannot avoid hydrogen. That's it. That, that's your life. Hydrogen is going to be inside the chamber. Um, the way to avoid, for example, water and other volatiles inside the chamber is that you bake the chamber. So you wrap it up with different uh, heating tapes and you heat it up until about uh, 100 uh, Celsius. So it gets really hot and you remove most of the water that you have inside. What you want is that the concentration of those contaminants uh, to be uh, way lower than the concentration of your ice mantle. So, and you, but you always have to subtract the contamination. That's why you run, um, you, you run different kind of um, um, measurements, uh, like blank measurements. For example, I take, uh, I, I irradiate just the substrate so I can see what molecules I'm desorbing from the substrate and not the ice mantle. I take a spectrum of um, just uh, the, the substrate with nothing. So I know what, what I have. So there is always ways of um, removing that contamination from uh, the background. Oh, perfect. Well, Gustavo, uh, we don't have more questions here in the chat. Uh, so thank you very much for accept no, accepting this you. invitation. <laughs> it is amazing. Uh, I, I, again, learn a lot. It's wonderful that every day I'm learning something. <laughs> this, is, this, this is why this school is worth 
I mean, yes. <laughs> every time I hear a talk, I am hearing your experiments or your comments. It is amazing. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this school. And thank you all the participants uh, for being today with us. Yeah, Tomorrow, you, unfortunately, we won't have a talk because uh, the professor couldn't make it at the end. So next talk of our school will be on Friday, 10 a.m. Uh, in Colombian time. So GMT minus five. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And I hope you have a terrific time with uh, the speaking on Friday, which I think I, I'm no, I know you, you will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And I hope it will be that way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.